Thank you very much, Dr. Wegemeyer, and thank you also to Dr. Fleischmann for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about a topic that is more than academic for me, that is very dear to my heart um, for um, multiple reasons. Um, so before I get started, I would like to share the screen uh, with you and um, um, provide some slides. Uh, but I see that I don't have the um, screen sharing enabled. So if someone could uh, make me a co-host and I, like that, I can share my slides. You might be able to do it now. Okay. Yes, I can do it now. Can you see the slides? Oh, maybe, yeah. Yes, I can see them. Okay. So, again, I'm, I apologize for all these uh, delays, but you know, sometimes Zoom is better than anything else. <laughs> so, um, I would like to start with a quotation. Actually, it was a thesis. Um, defended in the fall of uh, 1561 by, uh, by a bachelor in theology at La Sorbonne, Jean Tanquerel. And this thesis was that the Pope is the only lieutenant of Jesus on earth and has spiritual and mundane sovereignty which overrules the sovereignty of kingdoms. So why is this quotation or even this service interesting? Because the Parliament of Paris, with the support of Catherine of Medicis, took immediate action to suppress um, this uh, work. And uh, Tanquerel was obliged to sign a retraction that was publicly read during a meeting of the Faculty of Theology called for this very purpose. So this case illustrates the pivotal moment, and the date is not uh, coincidental, 1561, it's right after the Luther reform and the rise of tensions between Catholic and Protestants. So this case illustrates the pivotal moment when the symbiosis between God and Caesar, which is expressed in this thesis, uh, and which was characteristic of the political religious realm for centuries in Europe, came into question. And this moment was critical because the Pope's long-standing authority over the mundane actions of kings were coming to an end. And it's not uh, also a coincidence that Catherine de, of Medicis took action to, to make this happen, to suppress this thesis. It will take several decades after the war of religion to see a gradual acceptance by the church of the divide between God and Caesar. And this bifurcation will be theologically justified by the gospel passage that we all know, render unto, unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's, which came to encapsulate the relationship between Christianity, secular government and society in modern times by asserting the supremacy of the state power over the immanent or worldly affairs in contrast to the transcendent or spiritual domain of the church. And eventually it became the most cited excerpt from the scripture to explain or justify the inherent secular feature of Christianity in contrast with other religions 
that did not separate religion and politics. But as the Tanquerel uh, affair shows, uh, however, that's not always been the mode of interaction between Christianity and politics. And even today, I would say there are lots of data and surveys that show that uh, it's far from re reflecting the never ending interdependence of state, nation, and religion that we can see at play in all Western democracies. Um, so the point I want to make here, and um, that will be the bulk of this presentation, and also um, the materials that I will discuss are uh, part of a new book that's called We Gods and People, and that I bifurcate outside Islam to look at other religious traditions and the way they have been changed and their doctrinal content changed by the building of the nation state. In other words, the main assertion is that uh, the nation state, and especially the nation and the modern political community, um, is at the foundation of the religious modernity. Sorry, I'm trying to, to move on. Um, to the next slide. Uh, oh, no. So, and this modernity in which we are now, some would say we are even in postmodernity, uh, this modernity is founded on the secular religious divide. Uh, this is not a familiar with, for example, Jean Tanquerel. Jean Tanquerel is in a world that the religious community and the political community are actually lining up. Their boundaries are lining up. The secular religious divide will be associated with the rise of the nation as a modern political community, which means that the states claim uh, prerogative over the management of the immanent, the mundane, while uh, the Pope, until the war of religion, claims that he is in charge of the mundane as well. And that's how uh, what I call the sacred profane divide that you could consider a specific of the pre-modern era will be displaced, not erased. The sacred profane will remain, but will be displaced by the religious secular one. So what does this mean exactly? Um, it means that um, in the domain of profane and sacred, um, the, the, there is no divide between religion and politics. As uh, Durkheim has showed us, the sacred represents the unity of a religious group through collective symbols. And in contrast, the profane refer to the mundane personal matters. And this distinction was central to pre-modern religious communities, all of them, because the especially revelation-based communities like the monotheistic one are political in the Aristotelian sense, meaning that they, they provide directive, directions and vision um, that are not distinguishable or distinct from religious belief or institution or agent in the police. In other words, the revelation-based community creates an entity that is impossible to distinguish from the politics. If we think of the major prescription of revelation, it's not about the person, it's about the group. You don't kill, you don't steal, um, you don't lie. All these uh, prescriptions are about the stability of a group before being about the thriving of the believer. And I think we have forgotten that in our, not only in our secular world, but also in our secular scholarship uh, uh, about religion. So this conflation, as I just said, of the religious and the political community are very much obvious in the monotheistic message. 
um, in Durkheim's view, the central, the central influence of religion on collective identity was challenged in modern time by science and individualism. So the modernization process is indeed a process that will disconnect religion and religious and political community. And what I add in, in this new book is actually that the rise of the nation state has been the third major factor that has precipitated the disconnection of religion from the collective and political identities. So what does it mean? It means that in modern time, the sacred profane divine has been displaced by the secular religious one. This shift signifies that the secular nation defines the collective political unity while religion is perceived primarily as a personal belief. The first unseen consequence of this, of this change has been the emergence of new doctrines and narratives to adjust religious institutions and believers to the successive phases of nation state building, something we tend to ignore, ignore. but the, the new theological take on the profane, on the mundane and uh, on the immanent and transcendent and their disconnection in, in the religious perception is a direct outcome of, of this nation uh, building. The second consequence, and I will not um, very much talk about this today, but it's very much part of this new book, the second consequence has been the simultaneous exportation of the nation-state institutions and the modern conception of religion as belief and and that's contributed to the redefinition of religious tradition everywhere and also been part of their modernization to adjust to the boundaries of the uh, national community so let me uh give you just a brief our, our overview on how this went in, in Western Europe. So how did the secular religious distinction uh, came to be central in Western Europe? In Latin, seculum meant simple, <laughs> uh, meant, um, simply meant a, a fixed period of time, roughly 100 years or so. So in Roman languages, it evolved into century. After the war of religions, seculum in Latin Christendom was contrasted with eternal sacred time. And again, only after the war of religion. It then referred to this temporal age of the world as distinguished from the div divinely eternal realm of God. Anything secular, had to do with earthly affairs rather than with spiritual affairs. As a consequence, places, institutions, persons and functions were inscribed within the secular or the religious time. So the secular came as a contrast to the role of religious institutions and the church to deal with the immanent, uh, to deal with the transcendent, sorry, why the, the secular was more and more associated with the immanent. And that's the uh, transformation that will lead to the modern, individual postmodern thinking of psyche in which we are uh, today. So the transfer of certain properties and institutions out of church control to, the, to that of the state was therefore secularization. And for the first time since the establishment of the Catholic Church, the political community could exist outside the divine guidance of the Pope and be defined on its own terms. So that's the foundational moment of secularization. And my argument in the book is to say that it never ended. That's why um, I am uh, not convinced by um, the uh, concept of post-secularity, and I will explain also this a little um, later. 
So to give you a sort of visual representation of this before and after, when the Catholic Church is in charge of both the immanent and the transcendent, you can see it uh, represented here in the Lepanto battle, where the Pope lead uh, the, uh, the ship against the Ottoman uh, Empire under the guidance of the Trinity, of the Holy Trinity. This is exactly what uh, the sacred and profane is about. Uh, there is no capacity, even if they want to act out of the realm of the Catholic uh, Church, the kings have also to comply to an international vision that is a religious one. If I keep going with my before and after uh, in painting, then you, the, 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 the pivotal moment is when the Catholic Church loses its capacity to maintain the basic security of citizens. This is a painting, and you have lots of those, of a terrible event that happened in Paris, which is called the Saint Barthélemy Night, where uh, it was a pogrom basically, of, of Protestants in the street by Catholics, with the guard of the king not interfering because the guards of the king were Catholic and the king was Catholic and, in, and therefore it meant that he didn't feel like he had to, def, to, to defend heretics. And that's based on this terrible episode of the war of religion on which all the modern nation states of Europe have been built, that the state took initiative and legitimized its superiority over the church in the name of security of people. And then you can have a king with one religion and the different subject with different religion. It didn't happen overnight, but the breakdown is this very traumatic moment and this painting, it's interesting, I, I grew up in France, I was educated in the French system. You have this kind of painting in the French book of history until now to imprint in the mind of children that religion is trouble. When you let religion in the public space, that's what happens. And I think it's an important element to keep in mind, to also understand today the kind of French, to say the least, anxiety about the visibility of religion in public space. Also, you can also argue that it's, this anxiety exists outside France, all over Europe. So the after is here, which also we tend to uh, neglect, which is the rise of an international system based on uh, the sovereignty of the state. After 1648, which is here the signature of the Westphalian Treaty, after 1648, only the states can operate internationally and it cannot be done on the basis of religion. This is the foundational moment of the international system as we still know it. Of course, it has changed, it has, some would say, uh, it has imploded. Or, or has been very much um, uh, transformed, but the principle is still there. You do not exist internationally if you do not create a nation state. And again, the nation is not an intuitive, spontaneous community. It has to be uh, built, transmitted, internalized by people who become citizens. And why is it not a spontaneous community because it's built on two principles that challenge any religious community. The first one is the equality between individuals and the second is the sovereignty of the people. These are two major modern features. Um, again, that brings back my discussion or, or in engagement with Durkheim. It is not only science and individualization, it's also the change of the community. Well, what is our natural community? It's nation. Um, survey show even the way we are ill, even the way we think we are happy, how are uh, following some kind of national pattern. So when I talk about national community here, I'm not talking about nationalism as an ideology. I'm talking here about what uh, Norbert Elias and later Bourdieu would call habitus. 
a set of norms, expectation, emotional investment, body language, manners that come with who we are in the space we uh, uh, happen to be. And this space is usually defined by a portion of territory under a certain central authority um, and even if it's federal it's still recognized as a power of the state over this territory and again it's based on the deep down ingrained ideas that we are all equal or we try to be doesn't mean that we reach to the ideal but the idea and you can look at the way of democratization in Europe as a continuous attempt to make more and more people equal men uh, across I would say the aristocracy uh, uh, bourgeois divide men and women uh, uh, ethnic communities, all other religious communities, and we are now at the new forefront of this equality with sexual minorities. So, so that's the ideal. So, um, it means that, it's very, as I said, it's very difficult then to look at, at, at um, the current situation in which we are as post-secularity, for the reason that actually uh, there is no such as a fixed entity of a separation between religion and politics that would be inherent to some religions and not other or inherent to the mind of, of people. Actually, it is a learned process. And this learned process show a continuous interaction between several levels that we never completely uh, take into account altogether that you would define as secularity, but it's again, uh, it's a continuous interaction. So I would prefer the term secularization to take into account these uh, processes. And I would stay away from secularism because secularism is actually not a concept, it is an ideology. It refers to the emotional. Uh, expectations and norms that people tend to um, associate with this particular secular religious divide in different um, national contexts. So, um, for example, for the French, secularism means no religion at all in the public space. I live in the US, secularism in the US means something else where you may have indeed an institutional separation, but religion is very much recognized as an important element of the social fabric. And so if we want to understand how these processes work, we have to take at least into account the two first level I mentioned here, institutional and societal. And of course the individual is also important, but for my purpose here, uh, institutional refer to what we call everywhere separation of church and state. Uh, actually, uh, if I look at the landscape today of uh, institutional arrangement between state and religion, only the US and France separate. Everywhere you have the history of the dominant church, an established church that may have been disestablished, but you have interaction between state and religious organization. It can be cooperation, it can be um, a sort of a level of, of interaction between state and uh, hierarchical organization. You have different modes. So it means that at this uh, particular institutional uh, level, the separation is not the dominant way. Um, what is important is that if there are relations between the state and religious organization, the state has to treat all the religions the same. If the state starts to differentiate between religion, then the breach of uh, what you could call equidistance is, uh, is happening and it's this breach that creates unsecular situation. And the opposite is also true at this institutional level, no religious organization should try to 
put its, per, its uh, specific agenda on the state policy, like changing laws in favor of, uh, I don't know, uh, abortion or, uh, or, or prohibition of abortion or contraception. So this is again what uh, one of my colleagues calls the twin toleration and it's a much more interesting way to look at um, the institutional level of secularization because again the tensions are always there, it's never fixed, you know. I always joke that India, for example, is, is a secular state but India doesn't separate and religion is not um, removed from social relation and all individuals are very religious or, or, or claim to be. So what makes India secular is that at this institutional level until now, although the Modi uh, government is uh, impinging on, on this equidistance um, very heavily, at the institutional level, the state is committed to treat all religion equally, to provide the same resources to all. And at the same time, no religious group should take advantage of, of, of the state uh, policy in its uh, specific or particular uh, uh, favor. And, and that this balance that is now very much endangered in, in uh, India. So this is the first level. The second level, as I said, is the legitimacy of religion in social spaces and in public spaces. And that's the level that is very different across also secular societies. You know, again, if you take the contrasted the situation of uh, France and the US, you can say that maybe France and the US share some kind of institutional similarity, although I would argue that the separation in France is uh, not as uh, strong as it is in the US. But if you look at the societal level, the two, the two countries cannot be more different in the sense that France has gone very far to remove uh, religious signs, religious practices, religious narrative from the public space, while America is founded on the legitimacy of religious community to build the United States. So it creates here a huge disparity. Of course, the individual level is the level of uh, religiosity of people in the country. And interestingly, these three levels cannot, are not automatically uh, uh, similar. You can have, for example, a strong um, recognition of, of religion in society it doesn't mean that the individuals are all very religious. I've noticed that, for example, in a lot of Muslim countries, we, we tend to confuse the fact that religion or Islam in particular has been, has become central in the nation building, so very central in social uh, interaction in, in um, public space, but sometimes people are not, not very secular, are not very religious and have a very secular uh, lifestyle. Actually, the more Islamic in the institution and society, the less religious of people are. There is a sort of uh, <laughs> uh, negative connection here. So, what does it leave us, uh, what, if we want to understand that, what is at stake when we talk about Islam and European secularism? And here I, I use the term uh, deliberately because uh, we are dealing here not with the theory, not with the concept. We are dealing with a specific political culture that has uh, expectation on the way that citizens should behave in the public space. So, uh, as I said, if I can just go back to here, um, institutionally, all over Europe, uh, state and religious organization are regulated in different ways. I would say that that is not the level where uh, most of the question about Islam are uh, rising. If you look at the pattern in Europe, most of European states have tried to create a, an organization for Islam and lots of Muslim organizations are 
are participating in it, are even very eager to be part of it. Interestingly, this is never mentioned as a sort of adaptation or acceptation of secularization or secularism by, by Muslims, while it's there uh, in France, in Belgium, in Italy, um, uh, in England. You have all this discussion of the state looking for an interlocutor and trying to um, uh, comply or to make Islam comply with the dominant kind of interaction that the state has historically with other religious organizations. So I would say that's not the level where uh, the questions raise. Interestingly, um, and not very surprisingly, knowing the history of uh, uh, religion in, in European society, it's the second level, the societal level that is the most uh, critical, because again, it goes back with um, a very a stricter, I would say, division between private and public across European societies than, for example, in a secular country like the US. In other words, most of the expectation are that religion is private, that religion is individual or centered. Again, which is a long, long and deep transformation for, from the initial, I would say, revelation-based community. But that's the way that most Christian in Europe, I would not say most Christian in the world, because uh, actually what we see is that most of the Christian outside Western Europe do not uh, renounce uh, social ambition about um, um, the, the purpose of their religion, but that's very much what, what the norm is about religious, uh, religiosity in Europe. You are religious in your home, in your place of worship, and as, as not very much or as less as possible in the public space. So uh, that's the situation that creates a problem for uh, Muslims in Europe. I would say it also creates problem for other religious communities, but the socialization of these other religious communities in the West has in some way made them adjusted or ad as they have adjusted to this spe uh, specific uh, national and secular culture. Although it, it took time, I mean, the Catholic in France didn't accept overnight the, the prerogative of the state over the mundane. It, it took several centuries. And I would say it's only after World War II that the Catholic and the secular state really became reconciled. So it, it took time and we, we have forgotten that uh, it was not an easy process. So, um, for Muslims, we see emerging challenges in this particular societal realm through three different principles that organize this uh, uh, legitimacy of religion in, in public space. The first one is what's called the principle of secular justification. So this again goes back to what is the conception of the public space. And here uh, I see that tomorrow you're going to discuss about roles and Habermas and the discussion between the two and also the fact that Habermas has said in his most recent work that um, there is a need to allow religious voices in the public space in what he would call a second circle where groups can express themselves even if they express opinions, oppositions that are not um, uh, in tune with the non-believers and uh, that this position uh, doesn't mean automatically that the first circle does, should not translate into legislation or policy making. The distinction is hard to maintain sometimes, but the, 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 the fact that you, religious groups can express themselves uh, has been, I would say, very much eroded in, in uh, most of European societies. And when they do, they have to translate their position into secular justification. And when the group doesn't, then it is, it, this group is in trouble. Again, I give you a concrete example that goes back uh, to the recent history even of Islam in the Netherlands. A few years back, actually some years back now, 
uh, an imam was interviewed Moroccan origin, so not educated in this particular context. And a question was asked to him, you, you know the episode, what is the position of Islam on uh, homosexuality? I mean, even the question, if, if <laughs> uh, for all religious monotheism tradition, homosexuality is a sin. That's what the Imam said. But this position is not acceptable in a secular public space. You cannot talk about sin. You cannot talk about heresy. You cannot talk about blasphemy in the secular realm. And that's, I think, part of the issue that Muslims have had, even before this uh, discussion in the Netherlands, think of the um, uh, satanic verses. It is not acceptable for a group to come and say, we want, this is blasphemous and we want this uh, author to be punished because he is a blasphemous author. There is no secular language for that. Um, you can say the same thing with the cartoons crisis. Interestingly, with the cartoons crisis, some of the Muslim group, not some of the imam in Denmark who created and actually intensified the crisis that became global, some of Muslim groups used another body of legislation that is quite legitimate actually, which is a legislation against um, hatred, uh, speech and against uh, insult or discrimination of a particular uh, racial group. I mean, you can argue it's, it's race, it's not uh, religion, but in the, in the current circumstances, some lawyers said this was quite acceptable, but it was not heard either. So I would say this is a double difficulty. You have a lots of religious leaders uh, of Muslim groups in Europe who do not um, use the right language to express their grievances. And second, there is also an in a, uh, inequality in the public space. And that's where I take uh, issue with roles that think, you know, that if you follow the rule, everybody is uh, treated the same way. That's not quite what the the political uh, analysis show some are more equal than others to paraphrase George Orwell and that this inequal distribution of power that we have also to address. Of course some imams do not use the right language and also there is this um, assumption that if you express some illiberal ideas you're going to act on them. And, and, and there is a difference here. And that's why Habermas also was interesting in trying to say, you know, some, you may hear some illiberal way of thinking. Does it mean that the person is going to act on it? There is a difference here. And I am very aware that with the security issue, and that's where the French are going through a terrible crisis now. So the security issue and the fact that this intolerant language is also used internationally, internationally by political group, it's very difficult today to have what I would say conservative position on some issues. And again, living in the US, it's interesting for me to see that Muslims here do not have that problem at all. Actually, the most conservative voice on women, on, on um, issues of sexuality are not the Muslims here, they are the Christians. So um, it is interesting to see that this kind of position is acceptable in some other secular society where religion is not as illegitimate in, in uh, the public space. So this is the first major issue here and how Muslim have to learn, not Muslim population, again, the Muslim population is much more savvy in this uh, respect. I'm talking here about a layer of leadership that has not yet reached this level of, I would say, secular proficiency. Uh, the second level where uh, the question of Islam is indeed uh, a challenge is uh, in relation to the individualization of religion. And here again, it goes back to the tension between um, the, um, the fact that religion in Europe has become an individualized act. I would say all over uh, 
Western countries, actually. There is a disconnection between what uh, the religious community and the individual. And the person sees itself or himself as, as master of, of the individual choice and the practices he or, or, or she chooses to follow, while in most of the uh, world, actually, the, the, the communal uh, importance, what I call the societal influence of religion is very present. So it means that you have obligation to fulfill that cannot be just uh, explained by my freedom as a believer. That's a discussion I have a lot if, about Islam. If women wear the hijab, it's because a lot of them are not alienated by their husband or brothers, it's because of others, it's because they see it as an obligation that they have to follow. It's not that they, they can choose. If you, if you want to do, if you are on the Muslim path, it's not something you can, um, ponderate, to compromise. And I think that this kind of um, change on, on religion that is not only about choice, but obligation. This is a fascinating discussion among lawyers in the jurisprudence of freedom uh, of religion here in the US about adjusting to things that are either you can change that because there are leverage in the religious tradition to do that and things you cannot change. And, and the judge here in the jurisprudence, the judges here take this into account. While I don't think you have the same uh, legal culture about freedom of religion in Europe, and it's part of the issue for Muslims as well, that I do not see in the US, for example. There is no problem for Muslims to behave in their particular realm of prescription and, and clashing with the dominant norm of, of, um, of the public space. And so this, this leads me to the fourth um, uh, element, which is also related to the second, which is that Muslims, like other religious group, have embodied religious practice. The, the Muslim believer is not the Kantian believer. That is a, a, a rational agent and where religion becomes a sort of con cognitive feature. Quite the opposite. All the, all the surveys done, and including some I have done, when you look at the way that Muslims leave Islam, it's not about a cognitive approach. It's not about a rational choice, like I believe, I decide to believe, to behave, and to belong. Actually, most of them start by doing things. There is this idea that to be a Muslim, we had fascinating discussion. We had a, a group of young people were asking them what is to be a Muslim and the control group of young Christian, what is to be a Christian. And in the Muslim, there was no theological debate. It was about what do I do? I have to do this or that to be part of, of this community of, of Islam. While the, the Christian had a fascinating discussion on theology, the Trinity, the spirituality. So this is something also that is at odds with the conception of religion in most of um, European uh, secular culture. So where does it leave us? I know I may have talked more than I anticipated here. I think that this particular culture, and that's also another element of the puzzle, has been exported everywhere with the exportation of the nation state. And actually the secular religious divide is inherent to the building of a national community with the consequences on tradition that were seeing themselves in the sacred and profane, but had to readjust to this religious secular divide. Um, I don't have time here to get into more details, but again, I have worked a lot on Islam, but the, the, this uh, most recent research shows that it happened for Hinduism, it's happening for Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodoxy, it's happening for Buddhism. So, um, in, in other words, I'm pleading here for a sort of more interactive mutual site that we have to look into, to look at secularism not as an ideology, uh, not as a concept, but as an ideology that reflects um, in institutions, mentalities, and also 
uh, religious doctrine in their adaptation to the uh, national context. And I will close there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you very much for this very interesting um, presentation. Um, I think we, we I, I speak for all of when I say that we found it a very rich presentation where you went from, from very large principles and broad principles to very detailed things from your own background as well as your research, of course. Um, several people have written questions and I'll read them to you. Um, the first question is from, let's see, this was not the first question. Um, ah, right, this question. Uh, why is secularism afraid of the participation of religion in the management of society, especially Islam? Yeah, I would say, uh Again, this, this level of anxiety of fear it varies across country, but I think in Europe we, we have this trauma, if I can use some psychological term or psychological term, of the world of, of religion. I mean, um, if we look from the political aspect, the, the whole state has been built on the necessity to protect people against the excesses of, of uh, religion in public space because of this uh, uh, bloody fight between Protestants and Catholics all over Europe. And, and it has translated into narratives, into modes of socialization, into policies that have made citizens in Europe very suspicious about religion. If you, you are not a good citizen as much in Europe if you start articulating religious uh, belief or, or convictions. And, and for me, living in the US showed me the complete contrast, meaning uh, here it's the opposite. <laughs> if you are not expressing religious belief, you are not a good citizen. You cannot even run for public office here. Uh, I mean, we are joking that maybe someday a non-christian could be elected as president maybe although it's kind of a challenge but someone who is officially atheist probably not and trump was of course not a poster child for religiosity but it was clear that he was articulating some um, uh, religious points in the public space and this is acceptable while again i come from france and if i can give another personal anecdote uh, not personal but a civic anecdote charles de gaulle the president of france after world war ii uh, was a very observant catholic so um but he considered himself as the president of all the french so in his vision if he was in the public function in the catholic church during mass he didn't take communion because he didn't want to be seen as a religious person while in america it would be the opposite the person would run to take to take communion so this is a kind of um historical deep down ingrained that's the habitus uh, that's exactly what the habitus is things that we consider normal, natural, that we never contest. And that's why Islam is challenging European society because with the visibility of Islam, new questions that we thought we had solved, at least since the war of religion and the disestablishment and the rise of democracy, this was done. But no, what, what, what Muslims are, are challenging is exactly this kind of visibility or legitimacy of the religion in public space. Thank you. I think that was a, a very clear answer. I actually have a follow-up question for this, but I'll, I'll stick to the questions that the other people have, have asked first. Um, one person asks, uh, would the professor think that we should take colonization as a part of our framework to understand the secularization process in the colonized countries? As you know, for some countries, secularization became a part of the colonization culture for a long time, which indeed placed it in a negative context so the connection between colonialism and secularism oh absolutely 
Yeah, that's a wonderful point. That's exactly, this was actually the motivation for this new book in the sense that we, we tend to, uh, to look at, at secular issues in different contexts without connecting them. And indeed the process of um, diffusion, what was called diffusion of the concept of secularism, went hand in hand with colonialism, trade, expansion of the Westphalian system. And, and um, it was, in, I would say, introduced, but also adapted, even if the term remained the same, it was not implemented in the same way that it was in Europe. And also it's important to uh, grow, to recognize the agency of the people who were colonized. There are fantastic debates across tradition about what is modernity, what is a religion, even in countries that were not uh, colonized as such. For example, in China, with the uh, arrival of the Jesuits, the missionary Jesuits, that you have a fantastic discussion on are we a religion? Do we have religion? Is Buddhism, Taoist, Confucianism religion? That's the kind of influence that is beyond the direct occupation or, or, or exploitation of, of people, but that is co a condition to enter the international system. Uh, the international system as we know it today, as I said, uh, is, is created 1648. So it starts as a very small club of uh, uh, European uh, societies and it expands. And, and it expands indeed with the imperialistic project. Um, but, but everywhere you see that this new, uh, new uh, division between the religion and the political will will change the way, including the way religious elites think about that tradition. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I think this is indeed uh, an important point. Um, another question is, thank you for your interesting lecture. I wonder how the colonial project of Europe and race plays into the religion secular divide. There is also a field of scholarship about the question whether Islamophobia is a form of racism, for example. How do you relate to or reflect on these types of questions? Oh, um, I just talked about the colonial project, so I may just go back to, to the question of Islamophobia. That's a tough one <laughs> about is Islamophobia a form of racism? Um, because Muslims in Europe are not only carrying a religion, but they carry features that make them very um, particular in, in European societies. Most of Muslims have an immigrant background. It doesn't mean that all immigrants are Muslim, but most of the Muslim and the history of the visibility of Islam uh, in modern time is associated with immigration and again the post-colonial uh, condition. So when people talk about immigration in Europe, they are also talking about Islam. Then you have the fact that across European country, you have a concentration of a, a, a certain ethnic or national group of Muslims. In the UK, it's the South uh, Asian uh, origin. In France, it's North African. In Germany, it's about Turks. In, in the Netherlands, it's a mix of both, North African and Turks. So lots of features that you would associate with ethnicity and culture are also associated with Islam. And third, but not least, um, it's about socioeconomic differences. Um, and the fact that some Muslims belong to disenfranchised parts of uh, urban um, uh, context. Or, or, or disenfranchised element of the socio-economic uh, fabric of the, of, of, of the country. And this also weighs heavily on the way that Islam is discussed. So sometimes it's hard to say if people are, are discriminated because of immigration, socio-economic, cultural issue, or because of Islam. I would say the moment that the question is about the practice of the religion as such, and this is very clear when you have converts to Islam who are victim of the same kind of discrimination. That's why you, it's like the litmus test, you know, if, if someone is uh, 
bred born uh, French, but get into the same problem because um, uh, she wears the, the, the hijab, then we see here clearly that it's indeed a reaction against the Islamic practices. But for lots of people who share ethnic uh, or socioeconomic condition, it may not be all the time about Islam, you know, and that's a danger. I think this has been a major uh, trend that has exacerbated the question of Islam everywhere because when you say Islam you are not talking only about Islam and that's a major political issue right there. Right, yeah, it's difficult to disentangle sometimes. Uh, this question may also be difficult to disentangle which is more on a philosophical note. Uh, one listener asks do you think Habermasian translation and Rawlsian proviso burden religious believers and is it limiting religious expressions and aggravating the challenge of religious extremism? Do you suggest an alternative to Rawlsian and Habermasian approaches? <laughs> yeah, I needed a whole other lecture to get into that. But on a nutshell, e yes, I think there is a burden on the, on the shoulder of, um, I would say, religious citizens. And this Aberman says very efficiently when he say that, you know, you cannot express um, in religious terms your disagreement on, on issues that may um, uh, challenge your, 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 your belief. And that's what I was trying to explain with the cartoons crisis of the Salman Rushdie affair. But uh, what is necessary is a sort of um, space where you may allow people to express their grievances without uh, giving them the possibility to influence on policy making. And that's what I think neither Abermas nor Rawls pay enough attention to it. I, I don't think it's acceptable indeed for uh, some Muslim voice to say, you know, this is a blasphemous act and this person needs to be killed. This is unacceptable. But there is a space where Muslim could say, I am offended by this particular position, this particular attitude, without automatically thinking that uh, the, it will lead to some kind of uh, aggressive acts or attacks on the side of the believer. And I know it sounds like uh, easy to do, but I'm aware that it's very difficult to do in the current uh, condition. And I would say what is also difficult is that Muslims are the only one in, in among religious groups today to express this kind of reticence in, you know, about the way that religion is treated in public space. And, um, and that's a handicap because when Muslims go through some kind of equivalent or challenges in other countries, you see other groups rising and saying, you know, we are facing the same issues. While, as I said, because of the particular secularization in Europe, the other religious groups have learned to either to ignore or to, or, or, or to um, not address the issue or to treat it differently, while Muslims have still some kind of challenge about that. But I remember even Monsignor Lustiger in his last uh, years was saying, I feel that we need to, to give more uh, breathing rooms to religious voices in the public space. We may disagree and it's good to disagree, but it is, it is better than to let this Spoke, be spoken up than, than um, stifled or crushed by um, and creates more frustration. Yes, I would say that. But. Right, thank you. There is room for one more question, time for one more question rather. Um, I wanted to ask you on your point of embodying religion. Can we hypothesize that the more embodied religion becomes in a community or country, the more it is amalgamated in culture so then by doing religious practices become cultural ones. Oh, yeah, no, no doubt about that. Uh, I mean, um, embodied practices about, you know, um, the way you dress, the way you interact in public spaces with the other gender. The, the question here is very much gendered all over Europe, so that's the main issue. Um, it, 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 signals indeed 
um, a specific culture. The issue is, is this specific culture um, a, a sort of, again, to use the term by Macron, separatist culture? And what does it mean? Uh, does it mean that people want to live in their little enclave and not be part of the whole society? Um, yes, some people want to be like that, but it's not only Muslims. I can give you tons of examples of other groups who want to live in their specific enclave. Does it make them dangerous? That's the second level. Is this culture a sort of, I would say, counterculture to the dominant one? Uh, and that's why we need to uh, apply some kind of contextualization here. Again, it's because maybe I have been too much in the US where I see a lots, of, a lots of very conservative people. It doesn't mean that they automatically endanger the, the, the US Republic, you know. Some will, others won't. But that's the kind of distinction that sadly, because of all these terrible attacks, across Europe, we are uh, European, and especially the French, I feel for the French, <laughs> are not able or do not have the time to make this distinction. And, and that's the problem here. Yes, it's part of a culture. How much of this culture is a counterculture? These are the questions we need to ask. But you need also lots of political courage to ask this question. It's not only a question of religion right there. It's also a question of political narrative. And it's much easier to lump everybody in the same together and, and say that Islam is separatist, which, you know, uh, may defeat the purpose, but that's easier because the public opinion will be with you. Yeah, I, I think you're quite right. Well, that was the final question that we had time for. It's exactly six o'clock, so you timed it perfectly, despite all our cock-ups at the beginning with the technology. Um, I would like to stress once again that uh, Professor Cesari's book, We God's People, is forthcoming. I noted the title, so please, if you're interested in this, um, could, you, could you give an indication of when it will be published? Uh, probably in the spring of 2021, late spring, like right. June, right. if everything goes to plan. <laughs> right. Well, in, in these days, <laughs> this time, we, we can't be sure about that, of course, but let's hope that everything goes according to plan. Well, thank you very much thank once you. again. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for and taking I, I hope to join you tomorrow. It's going to be early, but I'm going to try to make the effort for some of the panels that look fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you for organizing that. that. That's great indeed. Um, I thank all of you for listening as well. Uh, I hope that you will join Professor Cesari and uh, Fenella Fleischmann and Brianna Gonagolet and myself uh, tomorrow during the conference. There are lots of interesting papers. Several of the people listening now will also be speaking then. Um, we have a Teams link as well as a Zoom link as a backup plan. So uh, things should go well. And uh, thank you once again for listening. Thank you, Professor Cesari, and I hope to see or at least hear you tomorrow. Yeah. Bye now. Thank you. Bye bye.